Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the Onc Live Peer Exchange video editorial series on medullary thyroid cancer. My name is Dr. Ezra Cohen, and I am Associate Professor of Medicine in the section of Hematology Oncology at the University of Chicago Department of Medicine. Today's panel discussion is on managing medullary thyroid cancer patients effectively in an endocrinology and oncology setting. The videos of these discussions can be found on OncLive.com. I have the privilege of moderating today's panel. For this video discussion, I am joined by leading experts and frontline practitioners with a wide range of experience in these areas. Dr. Stephen Sherman, Chair and Professor in the Department of Endocrine Neoplasia and Hormonal Disorders at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Mike Tuttle, an endocrinologist in the Endocrinology Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Eric Sherman, Assistant Professor and Medical Oncologist in the Department of Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And Dr. Lori Wirth, Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. Let's begin with a discussion of the differential diagnosis and diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer. Steve, what are the current standards of care for diagnostic workups? So there are a variety that have emerged in the last uh, several years, uh, and we can be assisted by two sets of uh, published guidelines that exist from the American Thyroid Association and from the National Comprehensive Care Network. Comprehensive National Comprehensive Cancer Network, um, or NCCN. Um, there are different settings that medullary thyroid cancer uh, arises within. Uh, for patients who uh, present clinically, their typical story would be of a thyroid nodule or mass in the thyroid, and uh, fine needle aspiration becomes the standard of care for the diagnosis for most patients. The other setting is one where medullary cancer is identified in prospective screening. And that's because about a quarter of patients have medullary cancer that arises within a genetic syndrome of familial medullary thyroid cancer or multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. And increasingly, those patients uh, can be identified through familial screening programs uh, that we can discuss later. Uh, but uh, identifying patients at a preclinical stage where uh, malignancy may not yet have actually developed but a patient at extremely high risk for the, the malignancy to develop. Uh, and those patients would be uh, diagnosed primarily on the basis of genetic screening and then biochemical assessment for a marker called calcitonin. That's, that's a great summary, Steve. And let's go to some of the current challenges in diagnosis. Mike, let's talk about the uh, issues of, of mischaracterization of the tumor. Uh, it's a rare disease. Uh, what are some of the strategies for ensuring an accurate diagnosis? So the difficult part is that most people with medullary carcinoma present like every other patient with a thyroid nodule. They have a lump in the thyroid or they have some lymph nodes that you feel. And in most practices, they've never or very rarely ever diagnosed medullary. And even most cytopathologists saw a few medullaries when they were in training. So it's a very rare thing to think about. So while finding needle aspiration is really good at diagnosing medullary cancer if it's on the mind of the cytopathologist, oftentimes it's not. So we will often see the case where we get biopsy reports that are read as atypical. They're not usually read as benign. They're read as suspicious, but definitely not papillary cancer. There's some spindle cells. Clearly this is probably something, but we don't know what it is. And many times, if that just rings the bell to say this might be medullary, then we can easily get a serum calcitonin that helps confirm the diagnosis. So it's one of those problems with rare tumors. It's easy once you think about it, but until you think about it, it's often missed. You mentioned the thyroid nodule and the diagnostic workup for that. Uh, who is the first point of contact? Uh, what, what specialty and, and how do patients get into the system? Yeah, most of the time it starts with usually a primary care doctor that either feels a nodule or thinks they can feel a nodule. Sometimes the patients notice the nodule themselves. Amazingly, the GYN doctors pick up a lot of nodules. They're, they're good at feeling thyroid. So it starts the same pathway as the general, I found a thyroid nodule in my practice. And then, it, depending on the practice setting, some primary care physicians will refer directly to a pathologist for a biopsy. In our area, it tends to go more through the endocrinology for evaluation and then a biopsy. So in most times, it's starting in the primary care setting. And at that point, the, most people aren't thinking of one of these rare tumors. They're just trying to figure out whether it's a routine thyroid cancer or something going on. 
might also add that uh, often now and increasingly, these nodules are being detected incidentally. Patients are having imaging studies, particularly carotid ultrasounds, and incidental thyroid nodules are, are being identified. Uh, and, and again, uh, a, a well-trained clinician, endocrinologist, or, or surgical specialist in, in the neck uh, may be appropriate in deciding the, the role of biopsy for evaluating that type of nodule. And detecting these small medullary cancers, or the rare medullary cancers, has really led to quite a bit of data, primarily in Europe, of people actually recommending measuring calcitonins for every thyroid nodule you evaluate, whether or not you think it might be medullary. That's not really been embraced in the United States because, as we'll talk about, there are false positives. People have mildly elevated calcitonins from, uh, from hypoparathyroidism, from Hashimoto's thyroiditis, from proton pump inhibitors, and so we worry that if we get a bunch of low-level calcitonins, we'll be operating on a lot of people that don't need it. But this concern about being able to identify these rare cases has led some people to actually recommend doing calcitonins in the evaluation of every nodule. Now, would that be cost effective? You know, it depends on who does the analysis. So uh, I've seen some studies that say yes, it's cost effective, some no. You know, the, if the likelihood of having medullary carcinoma in these nodules is like less than 1%, it's very, very low. So it, it depends on how much you actually want to pay for the calcitonin assay to do it. Are there patients who, before doing an FNA, you might want to know a calcitonin level? So the, the classic thing that we teach is if you have a thyroid nodule plus diarrhea, that, that's one of the, you don't see it very often, but a thyroid nodule plus diarrhea very often is medullary. So in that setting I would. Or a thyroid nodule presenting with flushing or one of those typical medullary kind of symptoms, or certainly a familial history if they'd had a history of medullary carcinoma. But the big one for me to do it a priori is, is probably that diarrhea plus a nodule. Uh, unfortunately, endocrinologists don't generally take a good history of diarrhea, and GI guys often don't take a history of the thyroid nodules. So if you can find one doctor to ask both sets of questions, I think you'd pick a few of those up. And we'll talk about the multidisciplinary team in, in detail um, in just a few minutes. Um, Steve, I think you mentioned...